And so I'd like to share some results on aerodynamic transport. I prepared three examples for you today. Um, so, so let's let's get going. Uh, so the idea is that uh, electrons can display aerodynamic behavior in transport properties was uh, first expressed by Radi Gurji. Uh, and so he considered a situation when uh, electron electron mean free path uh, is the shortest length scale and the problem shorter than any other relaxation length scales uh, due to impurities or phonons. This obviously requires a special regime of purity of the system densities and temperatures. So in this case, electrons thermalize really quickly at shortest uh, scales and times uh, uh, locally. So they achieve local equilibrium, but nevertheless, the system can be out of equi equilibrium globally. Then you have slow modes, for instance, uh, a hydrodynamic velocity, and you can try to derive and equations of motion for them. And this is what he did. So he started with kinetic theory, projected collision integrals, did some arithmetics, uh, and arrived at this equation of motion, which is, of course, very simple, just a Newtonian law that tells you that driving forces in a steady state are compensated by viscous stresses and residual friction due to impurities. So he still considered some residual disorder in the, um, in the system. New here is a kinematic viscosity, which is a shear viscosity per mass density. Uh, and the current is related to hydrodynamic velocity U. So now, uh, if viscous effects are irrelevant, we're sort of back to the ohmic regime when the current relaxation is governed by electron impurity scattering time, we get uh, through the formula. But in opposite case, when this term is irrelevant and everything is viscosity dominated, uh, we get into this Plazelius profile flow. Of course, we need to remember that pure electron electron collisions conserve momentum. So in this particular example, uh, momentum relaxation occurs at the simple uh, at the simple boundaries, uh, and so the solution of the simple equation gives you that uh, conductivity is okay proportional to density square of the width of this channel and inversely proportional to the fluid viscosity. So a couple of things about that: that uh, the uh, competition between these two terms uh, gives a natural lens uh, scale in the problem, which is called the Gurji lens. Uh, it can be expressed as a geometrical mean between the electron electron mean free pass and electron impurity mean free pass. It's one thing. Bulk regime and is when the width of the channel is much bigger than LG, so then you are in ohmic regime. And when W is smaller than LG, then you are in a Stokes regime. Uh, and uh, the key prediction that he highlighted uh, back in the days is this regime of the negative differential thermal resistance meaning that the resistivity drops when you increase temperature. Now, from the point of view of usual quantum transport, this is highly unusual. You would expect that you increase temperature, you simply increase the probability of electron scattering, so resistivity should go up. Uh, but sort of in the classical terms, uh, it is very natural. When we cook, we put oil on a frying pan, we heat it up, it becomes more liquid. So in this sense, it's also natural that there are regimes when resistivity can uh, go down if you can relate actually resistance to uh, viscous contribution. All right, so he published a number of papers, made a number of contributions uh, to the field, but the field was kind of uh, in, uh, not really active experimentally, and it was enormous challenges uh, to achieve those regimes. I think the first experiment that had words, hydrodynamic electron flow together was work of Lawrence Moore and Kamp. Uh, now there are a couple of caveats he uh, uh, plotted here, differential uh, resistance versus current. So it's a non-linear measurement. And uh, as Sean just discussed, uh, uh, his interpretation at the time was that at high enough current, you effectively drew heat the system. So this current effectively traces uh, a temperature and this current axis need to be thought as a sort of effective temperature. And this downfall was interpreted as a manifestation of the Gurdjieff effect. All right, uh, so in recent days, we have more examples of this behavior in sort of linear response regime. I prepared a couple of examples for you from this really nice review article by uh, Boris Pivak et al. Uh, so three of these plots are strongly correlated electron liquids or electron hole systems. Uh, this are gallium arsenide, this is silicon germanium, this is silicon MOSFET devices. Uh, these systems are special because electron gas parameter here is large, let's say 30. 
Uh, so it's very strongly correlated fluid. This example I took from the Pablo's work on uh, magic angle twisted bilayer graphene in a normal state in the metallic regime, which also shows a very similar trend in the temperature dependence. So the first example is the following. I'll try to give your arguments that a hydrodynamic theory can shed light into this temperature behavior of the resistivity. And so let me give you a couple of arguments how this can uh, be perhaps explained. So in order to do that, I'd like to use this ideas of uh, Andreev, Kivelsen, and Spivak, who suggested that uh, let's try to apply hydrodynamic theory for the strongly correlated fluids. Hydrodynamics in this case in the steady state is just a statement of the conservation of current, again, force balance condition and the entropy equation. And so let's, I'll give an argument for 1D flow because it's very, very simple, but then I'll quickly generalize it for 2D. So let's assume that uh, electrons are subject to a long range inhomogeneity potential. So not sharp disorder, but very long range. Uh, so we can calculate resistance through equating dissipated power in the flow to the joule heating. So the continuity equation tells us that velocity of the liquid times density is constant, even though each uh, quantity individually can be coordinate dependent in the inhomogeneous system. In 1D case, there is only bulk viscosity. So this term is gone, there is no shear in 1D. So the stress tensor then just becomes the derivative of V. And then the dissipated power by viscous stresses is just a convolution of stress and again, the gradients of velocity. So we get J squared, just multiplying these two terms twice. And then we get uh, brackets here as just disorder averaging over the sample size. So disorder average of the gradient uh, of the inverse density squared. So you see J squared cancel J squared. So we get the first term in the resistance where resistivity is proportional to the viscosity. You could do the same line of arguments for the second equation in the entropic flow. And uh, so we see a second contribution that uh, contains uh, thermal conductivity, meaning that dissipation due to the thermal fluxes. In two dimensions, you will have a factor of two here, and then you need to replace uh, bulk viscosity by the sum of bulk and shear, and that's what it is. All right, couple of statements. First, it differs from the Gurji effect because of this thermal contribution. Second, this result is non-perturbative in interaction. So nowhere in this argument I said anything about how strongly or weakly interacting liquid is. All of these complications are hidden in what kappa is, what zeta is, what eta is, and so on. And this is then a problem of the microscopic theory to calculate them. So in general, we don't have really good tools to do that when, let's say, RS is very big. Uh, but I'd like to try to sort of infer any information from this formula. I'd like to try to take a pragmatic approach, uh, sort of experimental one. And uh, there are a number of experiments, let's say, from Jim Eisenstein and others who've tried to measure quantum lifetimes because the particle lifetimes in these strongly correlated liquids. And the statement of many experiments is that at least qualitatively, in terms of main temperature dependencies of the lifetimes, they sort of follow Fermi liquid like predictions, essentially from the uh, phase space type arguments. Let's say electron electron uh, scattering rate would be T square and so on. So let me try to do that and apply those. Uh, conventional results to that formula and see what it uh, gives us for the transport properties. All right, so thermal, conducti so, uh, thermal conductivity is specific heat times the mean free path. So in two dimensions, one over T. And again, at weak coupling, we can do better than that. There are some logarithmic things in Fermi liquid theory, but here I just do bulk sort of uh, uh, approximations, main T dependencies without any uh, this extra log theorems. Uh, viscosity is uh, just proportional to mean three passes, one over T squared in two dimensions. So in order to model disorder potential, I'd like to imagine a two-dimensional electron system subject with um, a doping layer at the distance D uh, from the two deck. And I, I consider just simplistic Poissonian like uh, dopants that create this disorder potential. And the length scale D would be typical length scale at which uh, electron momentum is, um, conservation is violated. So the condition for the applicability of the aerodynamic regime uh, for us would be that uh, electron LEE must be smaller than D. And for liquids, it means that the temperature must be greater than E Fermi divided by this uh, parameter K Fermi D. For actual experiments, K Fermi D, depending on the distance to the two DAG, is, is a parameter ranging from 2 to 30, depending on the uh, heterostructure. E Fermi for very low uh, concentrations could be as small as just a few kelvins. So in fact, hydrodynamics could start in actual numbers from pretty low temperatures. 
All right, so T1 would be on set of aerodynamic behavior. Uh, so then if I plug everything back to this formula, so I have entropy per particle is linear in T squared is T squared, one more power of T is T cube and conductivity one over T. So the first term is T to the four. Uh, and this one, because the shear viscosity would be one over T square. And there are these floating factors of K Fermi. So this ballpark estimate. So now if you compare these terms, you see that increasing temperature further from the onset of aerodynamic behavior, viscous term dominates, resistivity first goes down, you reach the local minimum and then it shoots up uh, and then it, uh, it is dominated by the thermal contribution. Uh, in this model case, you can even calculate by how much it drops down uh, in this local minimum. It is a cubic root of this K-Fermi D. And if you play with... Uh, this key Fermi D parameter and compared to the experiments that I showed you, it is within the you know reasonable number agreement. Okay. So this is my first example for you. And of course, at higher temperature phonons would kick in and etc. But here it's purely electronic, so there is nothing external uh, involved. All right, so um, so now really the question is, what are the most kind of interesting fundamental manifestations of electronic aerodynamics in modern days? You can ask these questions about the variety of materials, about, okay, high mobility to dimensional electron systems, graphene, dolosophytes, ruthenates, and et cetera, all the number of things. So today I'll talk about primarily uh, about the thermoelectric phenomena. This work is done with my postdoc uh, and my uh, collaborator, uh, Anton Andreev, and close to the end, I will show you uh, a few results that we got with York and some extensions of those results that I found uh, recently. So it kind of motivated me and many other people in this area is this experiment from Philip Kim's group on measuring uh, thermal conductivity in the uh, Dirac fluid regime in graphene close to Dirac point. So one of the benchmarks of uh, thermal transport in electronic systems is the Lorentz ratio, which measures, or Riedemann Franz law, which uh, measures the ratio of uh, thermal conductivity to the product of temperature and electrical conductivity. And in the single particle picture, this is a universal number. And typically, any deviations from this number were attributed to electronic correlations. So in this experiment, uh, um, when the system uh, was brought to higher temperature from 20 Kelvin to 40 Kelvin to 75 Kelvin and so on, the measured thermal conductivity overshoots the expected thermal conductivity if we believe into this formula by let's say a factor of 10 or 20. So it's a really giant violation of the Wienemann's Franz. And so it was considered to be a very special property of the Dirac fluid. Uh, so this regime is constrained to temperature domain uh, the onset of this is somewhere at the 50 Kelvin. It uh, uh, disappears somewhere around 150 Kelvin, and it's sort of pinned to this blob of density near the uh, uh, Dirac point. Uh, so they had also a follow-up uh, experiment where they measured thermal power. Uh, again, in single particle picture, there is a mod formula that relates thermal power to uh, logarithmic derivative of the conductivity and these dotted lines represent mod formula and these are measured data at different point uh, temperatures and again mod underestimates the actual value of the measured thermoelectric coefficient by a, a factor of two uh, and in this case is a hundred percent sort of uh, disagreement uh, all right so uh, let's try to generalize uh, this uh, Gurji picture to electrons in graphene. I will tell you this not in chronological order the way I worked at this, but I think in an order that is easier to understand. So first uh, difference is that electrons in graphene uh, represent a non-Galilean invariant fluid. It means that the current is not only given by the onset of the fluid motion, not only aerodynamic velocity, but there is a transport, what I call in relative mode, relative to the stationary fluid uh, as governed by the intrinsic conductivity. Uh, and again, because of the broken Galilean variance, there is also intrinsic thermoelectric coefficient. And JS uh, also has uh, convective contribution and then Okay, this intrinsic contribution in thermal conductivity. So in the whole bar geometry, so I'll do right now very, very simple, like homogeneous, pure system, and then we'll slowly elaborate. So in whole bar, um, Navier-Stokes is very simple. So there is weaker stresses and driving forces. I introduce here a column vector of particle density and an entropy density and the conjugated uh, forces, which is electric field and temperature gradient. For pure system uh, with some width W, uh, this also, like in Gurji case, 
give the Poiseuille's parabolic flow profile, we need to recalculate uh, averaged currents, meaning here, and this would give us an effective renormalized uh, transport coefficients, uh, meaning renormalized by the viscous effects. So I'll present results that are tailored to the proximity to the Dirac point uh, for resistivity, z back coefficient, thermal conductivity, and Lorentz number. So the resistivity uh, shows um, a Lorentzian ship as a function of density, D here, the width of the channel. So in graphene close to neutrality point, intrinsic conductivity uh, was calculated by York. Uh, it is of the order of conductance quantum in two dimensions, modulo some logarithmic renormalizations. Again, I would put those fine details uh, under the carpet. Uh, now, intrinsic, uh, so the shear viscosity is uh, T square, again, modulus on logs. So I will look at the major temperature dependence of this object. So as you see, the width of this Lorentzian is primarily uh, governed by the shear viscosity uh, 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 right here. So you could sort of infer it from this transport measurement. Now, uh, close to Dirac point, intrinsic thermalic coefficient is small. For the most part, we can neglect it. So, for instance, in the thermal conductivity, this term is subleading. Excuse me. So, this term is subleading, and uh, you could reach in the regime when the thermal conductivity for wide enough sample is actually overcomes uh, or dominates with intrinsic contribution. And this is the ultimate manifestation of the decoupling of the thermal flux and uh, electrical conductivity, because uh, at the neutrality, everything is saturated by intrinsic conductivity in the system. So this gives uh, this uh, to this Lorentz ratio, which is a square of this Lorentzian, and the width of this Lorentzian, as I said, governed by this parameter that is universally expressed in terms of the intrinsic conductivity and the viscosity of the fluid. All right, so graphene, even if it's uh, uh, boron nitride encapsulated, it's not just such a perfect system. Uh, it is actually subject to this long range disorder potential of electron hole puddles. And so what I did is I took this phenomenology from Andreev Kivelson's plug, which was done for galene and variant fluids, and I generalized it for a case of the graphene. There are lots of things that happen uh, differently, but the key differences are the following. Uh, when you consider average, especially hydrodynamic picture, you accumulate an intrinsic friction coefficient. Unlike in the case of Gurji, this intrinsic friction coefficient is expressed through entire matrix of thermoelectric coefficients and is given by the local density and entropy fluctuations. And the second, I think the most peculiar effect is that intrinsic conductivity at the neutrality is renormalized by the viscous effect. Uh, and a uh, most uh, sort of surprising thing is that it is enhanced. So disorder typically kills conductivity, but I'll try to give you an argument why this peculiar effect happens uh, in graphene. So in order to do that, um, let me imagine an homogeneous, not random, but in the checkerboard, uh, but uh, the same argument works for uh, disorder potential. So if I consider the system that is globally charged neutral, uh, it is charge neutral in average. If I look locally, there are always this hole in electronic puddles. So it means that locally, I, I may have an excess of char a charge. So when I drive the system, there is a local force. So then when I drive the system, I need to consider density variations that are along the electrical field and perpendicular to electric field. I will call the potential and vertical components. The potential component is compensated by the pressure gradients that are uh, developed in the liquid. But in the Vertical flow, it's only shear. So remember when we eat uh, hamburger and we squeeze it, ketchup goes sideways. So it's a similar situation. Uh, so then, so imagine that I drive the system in X direction, but density uh, is varied in Y direction. So then again, from Navier's talks, what I'm trying to do is to find the average aerodynamic velocity in a steady state setup. And from here, you simply find that uh, U is proportional to local variations of density and this uh, correlation radius and inversely proportional to the shear. Correction to the current is aerodynamic velocity times local density variations. And the product of the two, excuse me, the product of the two gives you this average, which is very similar to the Gurji effect. It scales with the width, or in this case, the characteristic length scale in the problem, and inversely proportional to the shear viscosity. Uh, so we, you could do arithmetics uh, more precisely for uh, disorder potential and derive results in a bulk. 
So this is intrinsic conductivity from York, enhancement factor in uh, in homogeneous system, density dependence, thermal conductivity, and sort of all these uh, results for Lorentz number follow. Uh, we are not the only ones, of course, who worked in this uh, problem. There are a number of people who've worked on a similar problem before us inspired by the same experiments. We don't agree on all of the details, and there are a number of points that I'd like to discuss with the authors, but in some points we do agree on some, I would say, major sort of predictions. All right, so it's summary. So these are theory plots, experimental plots. Maybe one thing that I'd like to highlight that Wittemann France violated not only near charge neutrality, but even at higher density, because uh, it underscore uh, undershoots uh, the uh, Wittemann France prediction at higher density. So it's kind of a peculiar thing. All right, so another thing with whole bars is that you can try to do different, uh, play differently. You can inject current sideways. Uh, so Falkovich and Levitov predict emergence of the vertical component of the flow. Um, okay, so I'll keep that. Uh, I'd like to go to the paradox of you, which I, I think is really nice. So I was puzzled by this work by Falkovich, Shitov, and Shavit. Um, uh, so let me really quickly tell you what they did. Uh, imagine that we'll try to solve exactly the same problem, but in a Carbina device. So we inject the current in the middle electrode and collect it in the outer electrode. Now here, uh, current conservation dictates exactly what the hydrodynamic velocity would be. Uh, we just uh, simply see it must fall one over R. So it means that without even solving the VS talks, uh, current conservation already tell us what uh, velocity should be. Then you should be wondering what the Navier Stokes then means. Okay, what does it give you? You take this solution, one over R, and you insert it in the radial component of the Navier Stokes. And to your astonishment, you will find that the viscous force, which is the divergence of the stress tensor, is exactly zero. So then Navier Stokes tells you that if the left hand side is zero for a perfectly conducting medium, if the left hand side is zero, then electric field in the bulk of the flow is zero. So this should explain you the uh, sort of title of this paper, freely flowing currents, meaning that you have a finite current at zero electrical field. All right, so now let me get to the paradox part. So if there is no forces, you kind of feel there are no dissipation, what's going on really, but uh, you can cal calculate the dissipated power from the stress tensor, and it's just a sum of the two squares, and it contains radial and azimuthal components, and this part is non-zero. I mean, you can check it for one over our flow. So that is a paradox. And uh, so the resolution to this paradox is the following. Indeed, there is no electric field in the bulk. This is resolved by the fact that electrical, uh, so there is a discontinuous jump of the electrochemical potential at the inner and outer electrode. So there is expulsion of the field. I, and uh, even though the net force is zero, which is divergence of the stress tensor, the way the liquid force is by deformation of uh, sort of its shapes. And this is very similar how uh, microbes swim in high viscous environment. So they need to change their shape to move, to move around. So it's a very similar situation here. All right, so they didn't get it quite right. Uh, it is a bit more complicated than that. Uh, in reality, again, at, at least it's not applicable to graphene close to neutrality point. And so I've kind of generalized this to, uh, to that case. Uh, what happens is that it's not only electric field that is expelled from the bulk, but rather the force density, which is expelled from the bulk. And the force density meaning a combination of both electrical field and the local gradients of temperature. This simultaneously means to do uh, resistive effects. These are electrical resistive effects and thermal resistive effects that are sort of similar to Kapitza resistive effects when there are jumps of the temperatures at the interfaces. However, the conceptual difference with the Kapitza physics is that the amount of the jump in the thermal flux is determined by the dissipated power in the bulk of the flow. So the amount of the jump is controlled by the viscosity of the fluid in the entire set of the Carabina device. So I sort of calculated these things uh, at any density, but I'd like to give you an argument for specifically thermal part, which I feel is really nice. So let me uh, explore in this force expulsion condition. So imagine that we are exactly at charge neutrality. So then general thermodynamics tells us that the gradients of pressure are given by the gradients of the local electrochemical potential and the gradients in temperature. It's charge neutrality, this term is gone. And edge charge neutrality, the uh, electric part is gone. So force expulsion 
uh, tells you that gradient of temperature in the liquid is zero, meaning that the temperature is uniform in the liquid. But in order to induce the transport, you need to bias the system. So it means the electrodes, uh, temperature is not the same. So how do you reconcile this? You reconcile it in the same way. There is a, a jump at the left electrode. There is a jump in the right electrode. How do we compute it? Well, the jump in the electrode is equal to uh, entropy times the difference of temperature in the uh, one electrode and the temperature on the liquid. Now, this gives you a force. And this force needs to be compensated by the radial component of the stress tensor in the liquid. This I can compute because we know that the flow is 1 over r, so we compute r, r at one boundary. We do the same at the other boundary. There are two equations. What I don't know is the temperature of the liquid, but I subtract them. And so you will have then uh, entropy times the difference of the applied temperature. Uh, is proportional to the difference of the stress tensor at inner outer electrode that in itself, so the continuity equation is given by the entropy current. And you see it, it is viscosity divided by entropy density squared. And at zero density, this term is gone. And this is a combination that you would get here. So it's more like a mechanical derivation when you try, it's almost like a syringe type problem when you try to squeeze your fluid through, through a system by, by pressure, by a lot of pressure. All right, so whether it's real or not, uh, Shahal Ilani actually developed this um, fantastic experiment recently where they've tried to measure this. Uh, maybe a thing to note is that they see Gruji effect uh, in uh, resistivity versus temperature. Uh, they've done the measurement 6, 40, 60, 100, 140 kelvins. The low temperature measurements are crucial in order to, so the samples are not perfect. There is a residual disorder, residual contact resistances, and so on. Low temperature transport measurement is needed to quantify those artificial effects. Then when they go to higher temperature, when the hydro should show up, they subtract low temperature data, and then they locally can measure electrochemical potential. And when you subtract the low temperature data from high temperature results, you see the flattering of the potential. And this is a manifestation of the expulsion of the field from the bulk of the flow. Uh, all right, so what we did with uh, York uh, is to generalize this to the flow in magnetic field. Uh, then uh, the flow is no longer irrotational. You get as a neutral component of the flow. You can calculate the magnetic resistance, which is uh, happens to be inversely proportional to the fluid viscosity and some function of the aspect ratio of the carbina disk. So we originally did it for this Galilean variant case, but I now have results for thermal and electrical resistance all the way down to charge neutrality uh, and so on. All right, uh, so, uh, uh, so the big question of where the vortices uh, thus far, we haven't seen the evidence except for one experiment from Eli Zeldov a month ago, I think. Uh, I would say like almost an ingenious experiment that they've seen for signatures. Uh, but uh, so when I was at the exhibit in Milwaukee for um, uh, Van Gogh, I found this quote by him in his letter to his brother, which I feel is ideal for physics. It's just brilliant. I'll just go with you with it. He says that two things are remain eternally true and complement each other. Uh, in my view, are don't snuff out your inspiration and power of imagination. Don't become a slave of the model. On the other hand, take a model and study it, for otherwise your inspiration won't take a material form, which I feel is, is really true. I mean, we need models, uh, but then sometimes we need to throw them away and get wild with some ideas and come back with models. All right, so this brings me to the most important slide. Are you ready? So maybe some of you know this, maybe not, but I'd like to share this with you. So the solving the Stokes equation is an extremely rewarding exercise. I really encourage you to try it. You go to the web page of the Claim uh, Mathematic Institute, and you click on the bottom Millennium Problems, and there is a list of 10 problems for the solution of which you will be paid $1 million. So they say here that although these equations were written in the 19th century, our understanding of them remains minimal, and the challenge is to take substantial progress towards the mathematical theory which unlocks the secrets hidden in Navier-Stokes equations. Your homework assignment is here. Okay, uh, sorry, uh, all right, uh, yeah. Um, and the amusing part is that as a physicist, I don't think we take Navier-Stokes as something fundamental. Okay, it's a good equation, approximation to something, 
but mathematicians take it very, very seriously. So for your amusement, you can read the formulation of the problem. It's five page long document, so enjoy it. Thank you. <clears throat>